They marched from cities and corners of the earth for a battle. They were going to war, this time, not just one country against another or even a coalition of nations to invade or dethrone a dictator. No. They were going for war, and the war is against Jesus Christ. This is not a movie script, it is a reality that will soon unfold. These men are led by the mighty Satan himself, and they are so psych in their mind to win the battle. But who are these men? The book of Revelation, which was written at the end of the first century AD, describes how Satan will be imprisoned for a thousand years and how, upon his release, he will lead the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to a final conflict with Christ and his saints. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. In number they are like the sand on the seashore. In the Bible and the Quran, Gog and Magog are mentioned as distinct people, tribes, or nations. By the time of Revelation 20 verse 8, Jewish tradition had long since changed Ezekiel's Gog from Magog into Gog and Magog. In Genesis 10, Magog is a man and the eponymous ancestor of a nation, but no mention of Gog is made. The Gog prophecy does not necessarily refer to the end of the world. Rather, it is intended to be fulfilled as the so-called end of days draws near. According to Jewish eschatology, Gog and Magog were adversaries who would be vanquished by the Messiah, ushering in the age of the Messiah. One distinctly apocalyptic viewpoint within Christianity holds that Gog and Magog, here used to refer to nations rather than specific people, will be allies of Satan against God at the end of the millennium, as described in the book of Revelation. The Romanized Jewish historian Josephus knew them as the nation descended from Magog the Japhetite, as in Genesis, and explained them to be the Scythians. By the time of the Roman period, a legend was attached to Gog and Magog, that the gates of Alexander were erected by Alexander the Great to repel the tribe. In the hands of early Christian writers, they became apocalyptic hordes. Throughout the Middle Ages, they were variously identified. The Alexander romances also incorporated the Gog and Magog and Gates legend. One interpretation holds that the Goth and Magathy refer to the kings of the unclean nations whom Alexander drove through a mountain pass and prevented from crossing his new wall. In the romances and related literature, Gog and Magog are alleged to practice human cannibalism. Alongside Alexander's wall, they have also appeared on medieval cosmological maps, or Mappe Mundi. In the first centuries of the Christian and Islamic eras, Gog and Magog and the myth of Alexander, and the Iron Gates were combined and spread throughout the Near East. They are described in the Quran's chapter al kaf as the Yujuj and Majuj, two barbaric and immoral tribes that Dhu al karnain he of the two horns divided and walled off. Dhu al karnain is described in the Quran as a great, righteous conqueror and ruler. Some Muslim historians and geographers of the modern era believe that Gog and Magog first appeared with the arrival of the Vikings. In Ezekiel chapter 38, where Gog is a person and Magog is his land, the names are mentioned together. Uncertainty surrounds the meaning of the name Gog, and in any case, the Ezekiel prophecy's author doesn't seem to place much emphasis on it. Although attempts have been made to link him to various people, most notably Gyges, a Lydian king in the early 7th century BC, many academics do not think he is related to any historical figure. Although Gog is not mentioned in Genesis 10, Magog is described as the grandson of Noah and the son of Japheth. The origin of the name Magog is a mystery. It frequently brings to mind Lydia, also known as Assyrian Matgugu, or Land of Gyges. Instead of the other way around, Gog could have descended from Magog, and Magog could be a codename for Babylon. Based on their use in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the phrase Gog and of the land of Magog may have developed as a shorthand for Gog and the land of Magog. The context of a Hebrew example of this combined form, Gog u Magog, which was only preserved in a Dead Sea Scrolls fragment, is unclear. Gog and Magog together represent the adversarial nations of the world in Revelation. Gog or Gug the Reubenite is mentioned in 1 Chronicles 5 verse 4, 
but he doesn't seem to be related to the Magog or Gog of Genesis. The name Gog Magog, a fabled British giant, may have been derived from the biblical Gog and Magog phrase. The tradition surrounding Gog Magog and Corineus with two giants Gog and Magog, with whom the Guildhall statues came to be identified, was altered by a later corrupted folk rendition in print. The prophet Ezekiel, a priest of Solomon's temple, was one of the captives during the Babylonian exile, and the book of Ezekiel records a number of visions he had. He explains to his fellow prisoners that the exile is God's retribution against Israel for turning away. However, upon their return to God, God will restore his people to Jerusalem. Chapters 38 to 39 of the Gog Oracle, which follow this message of assurance, describe how Gog of Magog and his hordes will threaten the restored Israel but will be vanquished, and that God will then build a new temple and reside among his people for a time of lasting peace. According to internal evidence, the Gog Oracle was written much later than the chapters around it. Gog's allies included Meshech and Tubal, 7th century BC kingdoms in central Anatolia north of Israel, Persia to the east, Cush, Ethiopia, and Put, Libya, to the south. Gomer, a nomadic people from the Sumerians, lived north of the Black Sea, and Beth Tagarma was on Tubal's border. Thus, the confederation symbolizes a global alliance that is surrounding Israel. According to biblical scholar Daniel I. Block, it is unclear why the prophet's attention should have been drawn to these particular countries. But their isolation and illustrious histories of violence and mysticism may have made Gog and his allies perfect symbols of the archetypal enemy, rising against God and his people. One explanation is that Isaiah 66 verse 19, another text of eschatological prophecy, was used to cast the Gog alliance, a combination of the Table of Nations in Genesis 10 and Tyre's trading partners in Ezekiel 27, with Persia added, and the role of Israel's end-time adversaries. Even though Gog is mentioned in the prophecy as an enemy in the distant future, it is unclear whether the conflict is meant to take place at the literal end of days because the Hebrew term Arit Hayamim may simply mean latter days and is open to interpretation. Scholars of the 20th century have used the term to refer to the Eshetan in a flexible sense that is not always associated with the end of the world or the apocalypse. However, because it is a result of the cosmic conflict described in the Gog chapters that came before it, the utopia of chapters 40 to 48 can be described as having true eschatological character. Jewish tradition transformed Ezekiel's Gog from Magog into Gog and Magog over the following several centuries. Through the literature of the time, it is possible to follow the development and the changing geographic location of Gog and Magog. The third book of the Sibylline Oracles, for instance, which had its roots in Egyptian Judaism in the middle of the 2nd century BC, changes Ezekiel's Gog from Magog to Gog and Magog, links their fate to that of up to 11 other countries, and situates them in the midst of Ethiopian rivers. This seems an odd location, but ancient geography did occasionally place Ethiopia next to Persia or even India. The Greek text of the passage is highly ambiguous and different manuscript groups groupings of the letters into words produce different readings. One group of manuscripts, known as Group Y, associates them with the Martians and Dacians, a people group from Eastern Europe, among others. Three times, in the Book of Jubilees, either Gog or Magog are mentioned. In the first, Magog is a Noean descendant, as in Genesis 10. In the second, Gog is a region close to Japheth's borders, and in the third, Magog is given a portion of Japheth's territory. Seven of Magog's sons are listed and named in the first century Liber Antiquitatum Biblicarum, which retells biblical history from Adam to Saul, and makes reference to his thousands of descendants. As evidence that the names were interchangeable, the Samaritan Torah and the Septuagint, a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible completed in the last few centuries of the pre-Christian era occasionally use Gog, or Magog where the Hebrew original uses Gog. After the anti-Roman Bar Kokhba revolt in the 2nd century AD failed, Jews started to think of the Messianic age in terms of the supernatural. First would come a forerunner, the Messiah Ben Joseph, who would defeat Israel's enemies, known as Gog and Magog, to clear the way for the Messiah Ben David, 
then the dead would rise, divine judgment would be administered, and the righteous would be rewarded. Gog and Magog are covered in two chapters of the Quran, Al-Kaf and Al-Ambaya. Gog and Magog are subdued by Dhu al karnain also known as the Two-Horned One, in the Quran. After traveling to the ends of the earth, Tul Karnain encounters a people who scarcely understood a word who ask for his assistance in creating a barrier that will keep them apart from the Yajuj and Majuj inhabitants who do great mischief on earth. He agrees to construct it for them, but issues a warning that God will remove the obstacle when the time is right at the last age. Thank you for your support.